everybody. This is Jacob Warren asking you to like, subscribe, and share. Dave needs this. The Dave Hooker Show, represented by Banks and Jones, Tennessee's trial attorney. Play to win, banksjones.com. The Dave Hooker Show. A presentation of Off the Hook Sports. Objective insight. Expertise. Top guest. Available on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the Off the Hook Sports app. Download now for free. Also available on offthehooksports.com. I compute and obey. Now, to Dave Hooker. Ready. Well, almost a little too ugly in the first half. Almost a little too close at the end of the game, but no one will remember that when they write out the record books and the number of Sweet 16s that Tennessee has been able to make it to as they advance in the tournament with a 62-58 to win over Texas. Caleb Calhoun, I want to get your initial thoughts as you begin to flow in there I encourage you to be sure and hit that like button. Be sure and hit that subscribe button if you haven't yet, because we'll be with you through each and every postseason game, including the Sweet 16 Elite Eight Final Four National Championship game. We'll just go ahead and make a prediction that we've got four more shows to go. So Tennessee does advance. Hit that subscribe button. Turn your notifications on. And Caleb, let me get your thoughts initially. Let's start with what you have to think about a game that was never really in control, although it seemed like it might be that way with a few minutes left, but that wasn't the case. Well, Dave, I'm actually going to give you, of all people, some props. Can you believe it? You ready for this? I'll take some props. So what stands out to me about this game, and I think this is very underrated, is something you've said all year, which is that this Tennessee team is different, which is that what has cost Rick Barnes in previous NCAA tournaments is he has these offensive dry spells. Well, they were one of 22 from three at one point in this game. Three of 25 is how they finished. That would signify offensive dry spells, right? Yes. But when moments got rough, what did they do? They found a way to go to Dalton Connect. It was 47 to 42 at some point, and they dished it to Connect, and he hits a three. And Connect has struggled ex- actually at the foul line at different parts throughout the year. But what did he do? He hit four three, he hit four free throws to close out the game. And by the way, all four were important to win that game. Yeah. And, and there was the one fading, um, arcing over a long, lanky player that there aren't more than a half dozen players in the nation that can hit that, that had the size and the athletic ability to hit that and give Dalton connect credit too. He never got down on himself. He got low. He had the big offensive rebound dunk. He had another dunk and I never felt like he got overly frustrated. He was frustrated. There's no question about it, but I said this coming into the game after I took a look at Texas a little bit more and I thought that they would try their best, best to deny connect the ball they did that early I thought they may even double team him at times they didn't really do that but honestly if you go back to the first few minutes of the game the first eight to ten minutes of the game if Jonas Adu hit some easy shots and I'm not knocking him I just think it was one of those nights this is probably a more significant lead and Texas is more desperate early and the balls could even pull away i mean jonas they do missed at least five shots from within just a step of the rim uh if three of those fall you're talking about six points and maybe a whole different feel in the first quarter or so of the 40 minutes that were played tonight true and i want to actually address that because as you know dave i said how for how long that this team goes as jonas adu goes Proud of you. And, Proud of you. And I never said that to say that he's the best player on the team. He's not. Dalton Connect is the best player on the team. And Zakai Siegler is the second best player on the team. 
But what I said was it's dependent on the Jonas Adu that shows up. Jonas Adu tonight showed, and this is the biggest concern if you want to take a concern going forward. He's not tough under the basket. And that's a real yeah. issue. And you, I mean, he's finesse, but what if you could put Toby Iwaka's toughness? We saw Toby Iwaka drop 10 points tonight. He fought hard when he came off the bench, did he not? And oh, no doubt. I I was I thought it was pretty frustrating at times the fouls that he picked up. I didn't think he played smart, but he played hard. Exactly. Put Toby Iwaka's toughness and his heart and Jonas Adu's body. You've got it well, all. Yeah, Let's keep going. Let's add Ziegler's quickness and Dalton Connect's three make and no, three point shot. Heart. I just need the heart. Yeah. I just need Awaka's toughness. Put Awaka's toughness in Jonas Adu's body, and you've got Ron Slade. Okay. And Ron's going to kill me for that when I say that next week. But I, I'm just saying, in general, like you have Ron Slade without the three point shooting because Slade was a heck of a three point shooter. But Adu, he gave off some Blake Griffin vibes tonight, which was, for those who don't know what that means, Blake Griffin was super athletic, had all the talent, number one draft pick. But in the NCAA tournament in college, before he even went to the NBA, the scouting report out was punk him, cheap shot him. He'll back down. He doesn't want any part of it. Well, and he also can't do. Well, and the two also can't play more than eight feet away from the rim. I mean, that Blake Griffin started to create a little bit of a jump shot late in his career, but never really did. All right. So a couple of people in the message board, Awaka was in beast mode. Awaka was basically the difference tonight. And let's credit Rick Barnes for what he did and when he inserted Awaka when he felt like the offense wasn't going as well as it should. And it was horrid at times, especially in the first half. What do you think Rick Barnes is thinking when he brings Awaka in for key minutes? How important do you think that decision was, Caleb? Oh, it was huge. And honestly, Ron Slay was calling for that weeks ago when he was on our show back in January, that Toby Awaka needs to log more minutes because you can't let your bigs just get overworked like this and then have no depth. We saw this tonight. I, I, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this respectfully. Not using Awaka during the season proved costly in a game like tonight because Awaka didn't log the number of minutes he should have because he got in foul trouble, as you said, Dave. And I respect Awaka and, and I respect Rick Barnes for putting him in. But you saw he had to put J.P. Estrella in for a while, right? And I think J.P. Estrella is going to be a very good player. But he showed you why he hasn't been in the rotation tonight, didn't he? Because he, uh -huh. he doesn't understand how to defend backdoor screens i've never known a post player that can't defend backdoor screens but he can't i'm good i'm gonna be really honest with you i don't like jp estrella as a player right now i understand he may be able to give you some quality minutes but quality minutes to me is against saint peter's so that your guys just don't even have to play garbage minutes those are quality minutes for him quality minutes are not when the game is in hand i do not want to see him in the game if i'm a tennessee fan at any point when the game could still be won by either team and i mean that in all seriousness he is not ready he may be an all sec player one day he is not an all sec player he's not an all tennessee player right now I, when he gets on this court it looks like it may be the first time he's ever played basketball yeah, okay. I'm glad you saw the same thing I did because he makes basic level mistakes, right? I that you shouldn't make as a post long. player. So yeah, and, so, I mean it to me is is a guy who needs to do like some Zach Eady major footwork in the offseason. Eady improved himself. He's a better athlete than Eady, but he doesn't have the physical overall dominated ability. But he needs an offseason in which he does nothing but work on his footwork, agility, and his ability to get his feet moving. Because right now, they seem a step behind all the time. They do. They do. He does. He seems he seems absolutely a step behind. I, I have faith in Rick Barnes that in two years, you're going to see something different. The same way John Fulkerson got that got a lot of that heat when he first was at Tennessee, and the people fell in love with John Fulkerson like oh, two I years think later. Be, I think he'll be really good eventually. Don't get me wrong. I just think right now he looks like he's a 16-year-old playing with men. Fair enough. 
That's perfectly true. Here's and the remember, a lot of these guys are men because of the COVID rule. They're 24 and 25. Very true. Here's a big reason to be excited about this team right now. And I'm going to break down. I've already broken down why they're different. They could go to Dalton Connect when they needed to. But one of the things about the NCAA tournament that you guys seem to know is that a lot of it is not a lot of it, but it is six games to win it. And you have to be one of the better teams, but you also have to make sure you don't have a bad luck game. Right, Dave? That's a big part of it. Uh, okay. I'm interested to see where you go here because I think this was kind of a bad luck game. Shots not falling, particularly what they do. Is that where you're going? That's where I'm, that's where I'm going. And let me okay. bring this out. You have to hope you have to hope you either you don't have a bad luck game or that when you do have a bad luck game, shots aren't falling for the other team. Luckily for Tennessee, their bad luck game was when shots weren't falling from Texas. Okay, and... I'm going to play devil's advocate on that last part, may I? Sure, go ahead. They weren't falling because Tennessee was playing great defense, which leads me to a couple of posts on the message board that Bescovi needs to be benched. Vescovi is still playing incredible defense. Tennessee's perimeter defense is pretty good. I think that's why those shots were missed that you're referring to. So I don't think that it's just a matter of Tennessee needed help by shots rimming out. And with Vescovi, we talked about it on, and we want to credit the sports source for sure because they got the numbers up. Tennessee compared to uh, Ganey is about 20 points better when Vescovi's on the floor. So be sure and check that show out Sunday morning if it hasn't aired already because they pulled the stats up, did a fantastic job, and it, it, it proved to be true tonight, even though Vescovi was not good on the offensive end, as nobody really was. Caleb? Tennessee still felt in control, even though Texas made a run with Viscovi in the game. I agree. Tennessee's defense is what won this game. Here's where I was going with that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm not trying to say that they had good luck because Texas shot poorly. No, that Texas shot poorly because of Tennessee's defense. Here's where I, I was getting at. Part of bad luck, here's what always leads to bad luck. You're having an off night and the other team's having an on night. And what I mean by that is I don't care how bad or good the team is in March, Dave. You've watched enough of this tournament as I have. If a team is hot, there's no such thing as a defense that can stop them. They just hit. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a pitcher that has a sweet stuff one night in a baseball yeah. game. I don't care if you have Barry Bonds at the plate. He's not going to hit that ball. You know, Barry Bonds on steroids. He's not hitting it. So it's, it's the opposite in basketball where if a team is hot shooting the ball, there is no defense in the world that stops it. Tennessee is lucky that Texas just didn't have to come into that because that's actually kind of been what bit Rick, has bitten Rick Barnes in the past is last year, Florida Atlantic. His team was off. Florida Atlantic was on shooting. In a, in a game of, in a, in a tournament where you have to win six games, you're inevitably going to run into a game where you're off and the other team is on. And in the game that Tennessee was off, Texas, I'm not saying they were off. I'm saying that they weren't so red hot where Tennessee's defense wasn't a factor. And this actually kind of proves and validates more of what I say over time, which is that I've always said this. I don't think there's as much of a science behind who wins it in March Madness as people think. I think it's a lot of luck. And I, I want to give you a random stat, total out of left field, Dave. But Gonzaga just made their ninth straight Sweet 16. You saw that today? Yes. You know, there has been a bunch of stories over the past two years written that Mark Few can't win the big game because he doesn't have a national title. But none written about Tony Bennett, who has lost every first round game except one time when he won six games in 2019. Isn't that kind of proof that a lot of this is luck and just getting hot when you need to get hot? Well, no, I've thought that for a long time when it comes to the NCAA tournament. Um, luck is luck. But this is one of those games I didn't think was much about luck because neither team just got red hot. I thought this was just not wasn't unlucky is what I meant. Tennessee, so Tennessee was, I thought Tennessee was unlucky with those. They do shots not dropping and, and Moondrop Beauty puts up a great point. They were missing bunnies and it's so impressive that they were able to win a game like this. I mean, 
to me, this is almost as impressive as winning the game 95 to 75, winning the game by 20 points high scoring. To be able to win and not hit your shots, to be able to win and play a team that you've got to play perimeter defense again, your inside shot with a do is not dropping, uh, your threes aren't dropping, they were horrid. I mean, I think it's impressive to win a game like this. And they won a game like this with both teams struggling to score where you only felt like for about 30 seconds, Caleb, that they could actually slip up and lose it. Yeah, you know, I actually texted my brother at halftime because um, no he texted no, me. No contact, no contact with the personals during work, Caleb. No contact. Okay. Okay, Dave. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, I was uh, texting my brother, and he actually pointed out, he said, Tennessee should be very encouraged. They're up by nine and they're oh of what what it was, one and fifteen from three at that point. And he said they should be very encouraged. The crazy part is the second half, they were as bad from three in the first half. And they still held on for a win. And and and, and there is a between Dalton Connect and Jonas Adu, I will say this much, particularly with Connect, even though he struggles at times for the free throw line, there's a clutch gene with him. And I don't like to say that that exists. I feel like that's overused, but he hits a three when things are getting tight with five minutes to go. And then, even though he struggled from the line at times, he hits all four free throws when all four were needed to win the game at the end of the game. And I will give you, this is where Tennessee is different. I guess what I was trying to say earlier is, yes, Tennessee was unlucky shooting the ball. What I'm saying is that you can sometimes be more unlucky because the other team is red hot shooting the ball where there's no defense that can stop it. And Tennessee wasn't in that situation. So their defense was able to stop Texas. But I'm not, they should I be happy about where they are. No, I agree, and I I'm not going to moondrops beauty just because beauty just beauty. I'm not going to moondrops beauty just because uh, she has an attractive avatar there. But she brought up another good point. I noticed a dude didn't get noticeably frustrated. That's true, and he's gotten frustrated before, and he's been up and down before with all the short shots that he missed. If he threw his hands up in the air and said, "It's just not my night," somebody else take over. You could have understood it, but he was as just down the middle, smooth as you could possibly imagine. Taking a look at his stat line, go ahead and tell me what you were going to say, Caleb, because I, I think he just missed one free throw. If I'm correct, I'm gonna I'm gonna double check that while you while yeah, you make another award winning point. Yes, he was three or four from the line. He ended up being. Tennessee's uh, second leading score with 11 points, 4 of 12 <laughs> for a post player. And then you have Dalton Connect, who was 7 8 from the, from the line, 1 of 8 from three point, uh, the three point arc, 5 of 18 from uh, the field. If I would have told you that Dalton Connect was going to be 1 of 8 from the three point line and Tennessee was going to hit 3 of 25. From the arc, as a team, what chance would you have given the Vols to win this game? Oh, none. I didn't one see this ten. coming one, at all. Yeah, one in ten. One in ten. And this is the big point. You're right. These games happen in the tournament. They got all their misses out in a game. Is that a is that a decent way to look at this, Dave? They got all their misses out for the rest of the tournament. And because I don't think this is happening again. And you're right. We have to give Adu credit. By the way, I want to address something. A lot of people are criticizing the foul disparity in this game and calling out that there was this idea that Tennessee had an uphill battle. I don't think so. Every Toby Awaka foul I saw was a legit foul. He, those were actual fouls. And no, I agree. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna tell you. I was talking about this. The officiating in the in, in college basketball is horrible all the time. We could make it a topic all the time, but I do think those were fouls. Um, and I, I think the official. I, I noticed a couple of missed fouls, but I take a half dozen missed fouls nowadays, Caleb. Just with a grain of salt. That's just what they are. Jeremy Hayes uh, says that going to have to make some shots moving forward. They are, especially with the passing in the paint that they had. Crawdad Watson throwing a little cash our way. We greatly appreciate uh, that. And uh, it's teams locked in, Dave, is what uh, Moon Drops Beauty is telling me. The avatar just sticks out. It's a very attractive avatar. I'm telling you, I've seen it in their eyes. They do look locked in, and they do look fresh. I don't think any of the missed shots or the poor play in the first half offensively had to do with with what Tennessee was doing. Um, as I'm sorry, had to do with any of their 
their freshness or their lack of energy. I think they've had plenty of rest over the past couple of weeks. And I think that Tennessee has also um, was able to rest up against St. Peter's. It's a fresh team should continue to get fresher. Now the question I have is, are they in rhythm? Because if they did what you did, which is take the SEC tournament, what you say they did, they took the SEC tournament off or whatever. That's just playing three games in two weeks. So what do you do to get back into rhythm before you head into the second weekend of the tournament, Caleb? Yeah, I think, well, nowadays, okay, this is a Saturday game. Their next game will be on a Thursday or Friday. It's still a bit of a layoff, but I think they'll be okay. I can't imagine them being that off again, shooting the ball. We could see, but they've been off like that two times in three weeks now because they were off like that against Mississippi State. They were off like that in this game. Now, we actually have to um, give credit before we go forward to, because we're talking about Tennessee's defense. I will say this. Texas is a well-coached defensive team. They contested every shot. I'm sure you noticed that too. Mm -hmm. And so we have to say that. I don't think they'll run into a defense like that. I think they're in very good position, honestly. And don't forget, Toby Awaka was banged up on Thursday. They played him in this game, and he still got eight points. He could probably be fresher going forward. Santiago Vescovi is hit or miss on if he's going to be hot or not. Obviously, in this game, 0 of 3 from three wide open threes and missed them all. <laughs> maybe that means, I mean, maybe that means next game he'll hit them. Who knows? But I look, if, if they just hit, they were six of 25, excuse me, three of 25 from three. If they just go six of 25, which would have had them 24%, which is still abysmal, by the way. They're winning this game in a blowout. You don't think they can go eight of 25 against whoever they play next or nine of 25, maybe? And if that happens, maybe even 10 of 25. They go 10 of 25, 40%. They're going to the Elite Eight no matter what. And law of averages suggest, y'all call me crazy, because I know law of averages doesn't sound right. Like if I flip a coin and it lands on heads 10 straight times, there's still only a 50-50 chance that it's going to land on heads in the 11th time. But still, law of averages has to work out at some point, right, Dave? Where you just can't keep missing like that from three. Yes, yes. And we're, we're getting asked to address Tennessee's potential matchup. And here's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to do that at the very end because a lot of people may be watching this on Sunday and they're going to know who the matchup is. So that's just kind of the the way you the YouTube works. The way the YouTube works is also please hit subscribe. We greatly appreciate that. A lot of new people on board. As a matter of fact, this is record for the most concurrent viewers when you include Twitter and all our, our multiple platforms. I can see a number that's making me darn happy and darn proud to be a part of this group with, on with Caleb and with this community that continues to grow. We truly love you all. So let's let's talk about that for a second. Uh, Creighton is Creighton. They're going to win or lose with the three pointers. Um, they're going to take a lot of them. Um, as far as Oregon, um, the Ducks are really, really limited. They've got eight healthy players. So uh, I, I would imagine that the better matchup would be Oregon based off what I know about those two teams right now. But here I'm going to say it, that I think Creighton's going to win that game. And if you're watching it after we've done it live on Saturday night and Oregon wins, you're like, Dave's an idiot. But that's just kind of where we are in the, the, YouTube, the YouTube world. So that I think Tennessee would rather play Oregon. But by the same token, doesn't Creighton seem like the team that always makes a mini run? You get kind of excited about Creighton and then they end up flubbing up in the Sweet 16, but everybody the next year thinks Creighton's going to be the next Gonzaga, and they're going to have an impact on the tournament for years to come, but it just hasn't happened at that point. Please hit like and subscribe. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button if you're new to the program. If you're watching on Twitter, I'll tell you what I'll do. I would love a retweet as we try to set a record for most concurrent viewers right here. The ball's headed to the Sweet 16. I'll remind you, the Dave Hooker Show with Caleb Calhoun airs each and every weekday at 10 a.m. Eastern. And we are certainly, certainly proud to be represented by Banks and Jones. Caleb, let me ask you, because we're predicting the future or the past, or depends when you're watching, Tennessee would rather play 
uh, I mean, this is tough because of the way the game's going right now because I'm watching it, but uh, they would obviously... Oh, no, probably, yeah. There's no way we can provide a correct answer. Yeah, they, they would obviously rather play... Uh, I think they'd rather play Oregon. You know what, Dave? Let's save this because we're going to talk about it on Monday. So for okay. those who want our Sweet 16 talk, we, we'll have it for you on Monday. We can't talk about it live right now. What we can say is that Tennessee um, is in a very good position. And I can give you a little bit of history real quick. This is only the second time in history, Dave, that Tennessee has reached the second weekend of the NCAA tournament two years in a row. And the only other time was... 2009, 2010 under Bruce Pearl, and 2010 they made the Elite Eight. And look, if they can, this is my bold statement, but if they can win one more NCAA tournament game, we're going to have the conversation of Rick Barnes as the greatest coach in Tennessee basketball history. Well, I think it's, I would think it's pretty much a lock then, but we're going to have that conversation a little bit later. But I think you're very close to that. Just to answer the question real quick. I think either matchup is a great matchup for Tennessee because they're deeper on the bench than Oregon's going to be, and they can play perimeter defense against Creighton's three. But let's move on. Now, somebody said that you you need Purdue to lose. You do. I watched a lot of Zach Eady today. If you're going to advance into the final four, you would love Purdue to lose because easy Eady is just a tough matchup. He's he's kind of like a, a Shaquille O'Neal in today's modern age of positionless basketball. He's just a big dude that goes down low that's kind of unstoppable. I don't know who would stop him. Don't, again, want to get too ahead of ourselves. But um, a couple of notes. Tennessee got lucky. Somebody said Tennessee got lucky. Caleb, did Tennessee get lucky? Tennessee survived. No, no, no. Tennessee did not get lucky. They were not unlucky. Because they survived an unlucky shooting night, but they could have been even more unlucky if Texas was hot. But Texas was not hot. In which case, you get this outcome. And as far as Zach Eady and the bigs, I mean, I want to point this out, guys. Shaq didn't win a national championship when he was in college. No, he and, didn't. And also, ever, it. You have to go back to the John Wooden UCLA days where a center won a national championship in college. Is that fair to say? Well, yeah, and let's and let's flip flop. I, I think he's tough to stop on offense, but let's flip flop. Is he going to be able to run with Adu down the court? I mean, that that's going to be I mean, Adu's going to be able to get in great position because he's a much better athlete if that were to happen. We're way ahead of ourselves. Um, I don't think they got lucky because Tennessee played great perimeter defense. There are three or four Texas shots that could have fallen that didn't, and they were open three pointers. You get two of those out of that three or four to fall. You're, you're looking at a different game, but at the end of the day, I thought Tennessee was going to be able to get a stop when they needed one. And maybe they got a little lax when it went from about eight to two, but I, I still felt like Tennessee was, was in control. And at the end of the day, correct me if I'm wrong, Texas never had a chance to actually take the lead with the ball, right? Or do they have it down? No, they had a chance to ball. tie. They had a chance to tie right. late, but never to take the lead. Yeah, you are right about that. And they kind of got red hot from three, like right at the end of the game, which made it way closer than it was. But we we knew by that point it would be a free throw contest. And again, Dalton Connect and Jonas Ady were clutch. I mean, the only criticism I have is there was a point where Texas cut it to one and I don't know why Rick Barnes allowed for the ball to go to Adu in the imbalance when Texas was going to foul, but Adu hit both free throws. I thought the same thing. I want to give you, because Caleb Calhoun was one of the very first to say that Jonas Adu was the key. It was going to go as he went. So Caleb was one of the first guys to say that. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I'm going to give you three factors and you rank the most important factor. One, two, three. I'm giving you a do, which you were ahead of the curve on. I'm giving you balls, three point shooting, or I'm giving you balls defense. What's the most important rank them? Those three, if you can, please. Going forward, or what was the most important from the win in this game? Going forward. 
I mean, I'm always going to say three point shooting because three point shooting. If you're hitting man, no one stops you in this in this tournament. That's that's a key thing. I'm actually going to go with yours. I'm going to go with Adu as number one for me. So I'm going to go with Adu number two, and the and about because you you said Vol's defense number three, but the defense goes as Adu does. So if Adu is himself, the defense will follow because. People forget this. Even tonight in this game against Purdue, um, excuse me, against uh, Texas, his interior defense was there, even though he struggled at times on the other side. Mm-hmm. He was always altering shots. He took away the inside game for Texas completely, and that's a huge reason Tennessee won. Yeah. I'm going. I'm going. Adu. I'm. I'm actually. I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm going defense second, and I'm going three point shooting as last. Because, and I know that's in the NCAA tournament, but I just don't think they're built to win that way. Dave, and I'm getting drunk for you saying that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they're built to win that way, so they're fine if the three-point shot isn't dropping. It didn't drop tonight, and they still won. So hit that like and subscribe button. Again, I'm about to set a record for most concurrent viewers. Don't look at the number because you'll get excited. But we're with you each and every weekday at 10 a.m. So... For those that were concerned about Tennessee and the way they ended the season, I still didn't like the loss to Kentucky. However, I will tell you that I thought it was uh, a tired basketball team. You think that they threw it. (laughs) No, hold on. Hold on. You think that they took less of an emphasis on it. Is that fair? On the Kentucky game, they took less of an emphasis on. They threw the SEC tournament game. Okay. All right, I'm not with you and what you said about the Kentucky game, but I don't doubt the SEC tournament game when I thought you were crazy just a couple weeks ago for even mentioning that. Um, so uh, how do you see this team uh, moving forward? They seem to have a maturity that a lot of these other teams in the NCAA tournament don't have. <laughs> Kentucky, excuse me. Well, this is it's so hilarious you say that because this is why when I, I understood what Ron Slee said to us a couple of weeks ago, um, because he said because he's right. And this is why I, I'm going to do a victory lap around him because I'm going to say I was right. But he's going to deny all day that they actually uh, threw the tournament, which is fine. But I, the, the, the disparity I had was that he said young teams in college, you can't do that with them because they're not going to be able to turn it back on. And I typically would agree. But. Most teams are not as experienced as a team like Tennessee. So Kentucky can't turn it off and turn it on, as we found out. But Tennessee can. And I think they did. Especially and, that especially that DK guy. Yeah, especially Dalton Connect. And by the way, guys, Tennessee's kind of carrying the torch for the SEC, which has been awful in the tournament. Oh, it's been horrible. And, you know, the other thing I liked about Dalton Connect is, have you ever heard the term get ready? I hate that term. It's stay ready. It's be ready all the time. You don't know when it might be summer and you need to take that shirt off because you're by the pool because you want to look good. You want to stay ready. You can't just get ready because you know you're going to a pool on Saturday, right? This t- Dalton Connect stays ready. And by that, I mean he keeps attacking and keeps attacking. They Caleb saying the Walker. dad bod never shows up on Dalton Connect. Yes. He's got that six pack the whole no, time. He's rocking it. And, but he just kept pressing. He was ready, ready, ready for when he did get that shot, when he could hit that big fadeaway, when he could take a, uh, an A-do miss and throw it down, when he, ha- he had another opportunity for a, duck, a dunk. He just keeps pressing. He never removed himself from the game, which a lot of superstars and even more average players would, Caleb. No, that's true. You're right. You're right. That's a great point. He, uh, Especially a first-year player, it would be understandable if he said, man, guys, this ain't my night. You all take it. He didn't do that. He kept taking shots. He did. And he he tried to manufacture ways to score because, again, he still finished with 19 points. Now, yes, there were four free throws at the end, but he still had 15 points before the garbage free throws because he was manufacturing points when he needed points. And um, just so y'all know, um, the reason Dave brought that up, I'll, I'm just going to speak and vouch for him for a minute because um, before his – this was right after his son went off to college, Dave shedded his dad bod. He went straight for the six-pack, man. <laughs> straight for the six-pack. 
<laughs> I did. Instead of it, uh, and instead of the divorce diet, I went on the uh, empty nester diet. Whatever that yes, is. Yes, you did. Um, uh, it, <laughs> well. I tell you what, it's exciting uh, to see Tennessee make it to the Sweet 16. There's something about being in that second weekend that um, Tennessee fans should celebrate, no matter what happens moving forward. And what could happen this season could any could be anywhere from a Sweet 16 bid to Tennessee making the Elite Eight. You suddenly have to discuss. Rick Barnes being the greatest coach in Tennessee basketball history, as Caleb brought up, they're one win away from that. I believe when you compare to Bruce Pearl's record and uh, no offense to the Ernie and Bernie show, but Ray Mears was ne never able to advance in the NCAA tournament. So the community continues to build. I'm not afraid to say over a thousand concurrent viewers right now, which has not happened before. So we certainly appreciate you hit that like and subscribe. Tell a friend over the weekend. I don't know that a lot of people were here for you other than us. So he's Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker. This has been a presentation.